Hello listeners, movie fans, YouTube viewers, Apple podcasters, SoundCloud artists, and everyone else out there, and welcome to the premiere of the Cinema Wire podcast and the Film Enthusiast Show, a Juan Barrera production. This podcast will be available on YouTube, SoundCloud, and possibly Apple Podcasts. Go follow me on Instagram at Cinema Wire Podcast and Twitter at Cinema Wire Pod to get updates on future episodes. Also, if you're listening on YouTube, subscribe to the channel and like this video, please. For our first episode, I'll be experimenting with the format for YouTube, but the SoundCloud and Apple Podcast versions will remain the same for now. Um, I apologize if the audio is not as great as I thought it would be. I'm just in a really echoey room and I need to get more sound pro- soundproof panels. So I apologize for that in advance if the sound isn't perfect. Um, I'll be going over new films I'm interested in and old films you guys recommend me to talk about on the Film Enthusiast Show. I will have more shows based around different topics. For example, I will have a comic book review podcast called The Comic Panel, a TV show review podcast called Past the Remote, and a horror movie review show called The Horror Fanatic. Uh, stay tuned for more info on those shows, however, through my Instagram and Twitter. So why don't we get started today with The Joker? So I'm going to be going over several topics, one at a time, and kind of discussing um, chronologically throughout the film and my thoughts and opinions about the film. So why don't we start off with Joaquin Phoenix as Arthur Fleck and Joker. I think his acting was superb. Joaquin Phoenix absolutely killed it as Arthur Fleck. Um, we get uh, the Joker later on in the movie, to um, about into Act 3 in the movie, where he finally turns into the Joker. But we get more Arthur Fleck from Joaquin Phoenix, and I have to say, it is absolutely horrifying what he did with the character. It is literally a character study for the Joker, and it's an incredible acting that Joaquin Phoenix did. I have to give him a 10 out of 10 when it comes to his acting skills and his acting chops when it came to this movie. Um, I say that he should be at least considered for an Oscar nomination. Um, we'll actually talk about the awards that this movie has won or been participating in um, when, it, for, when it came out. Uh, but why don't we start with the side characters moving on from Joaquin Phoenix. Um, I would say that we had Robert De Niro play Murray, a, a c- comedian co- uh, show host. We had Thomas Wayne. We had Zazie Beetz character, which was um, in the movie Joker's, quote, girlfriend. And we had Randall, which was a co-worker that Joker was, um, worked with, um, a guy that really screwed him around a lot. And I'm just going to go over each one of their takes and the, on their characters. Um, I'm going to start off with the biggest actor, Robert De Niro, as Murray. Um, I have to say that this movie was kind of a love letter to Taxi Driver and the, the King of Comedy. So I feel like they, that's why they had to include Robert De Niro in the movie. And I have to say he did an amazing job as Murray. He, he was someone who felt really realistic. It's something any co-host, any show host would do these days. Bring in someone just to make fun of them. I think it's something that's very realistic. And, so, and I have to say, he didn't see the errors in his ways. He didn't think that his words would hurt anybody. But in reality, it was hurting someone. In this case, it was Arthur Fleck. And he chose to, to hurt someone that he had no idea what the capabilities Arthur Fleck had. So I have to say that Robert De Niro killed it as Murray. He was very charismatic. I liked how he danced when he was in, the, in, the, in his talk show. Um, he was very likable, but at the same time, he was kind of a, a jerk. He was someone who didn't care about the feelings of others. He was always there making fun of other people. And I have to say, he really killed it as the character. Uh, moving on to Thomas Wayne. I have to say, this is the most realistic take of Thomas Wayne yet. Because when you look at the other iterations, you look at The Dark Knight Rises, you look at The Dark Knight, you look at Batman Begins, you look at the, the Michael Keenan versions, you look at the even the Batman v Superman versions, you look at every version of Thomas Wayne in live action. And he is always the most likable guy. He is the perfect man. You can never hate him. And it feels kind of unrealistic, actually. And when you come into the to-, to this one, it's actually what a rich person would would actually think how would think. He doesn't. He pities the poor because he thinks that they can't bring themselves up from the poor, from that poor from poverty. And he's actually kind of a jerk. He doesn't understand their situation, so therefore he's oblivious to it. And that's something that's very realistic, which I actually liked about Thomas Wayne. He came off as a jerk, but that's really um, kind of realistic. I can understand his point of view. Just because he never experienced what it was like to be poor, that, that I, I can understand why. Sure, he was trying to help out people in his own way as becoming mayor in the movie, but he was somebody who was very unaware of what his words could actually affect people. And that's what caused so many people to rile up and kind of follow the Joker movement in the movie. So I have to say um, the actor who played Thomas Wayne did a, well, a good job being unlikable and likable, but I like the take that it was very realistic. And that's something I really appreciated about the film, the fact that it was very realistic. 
Uh, moving on with Zassy Beats character, she I don't think she ever gets a name. Um, if I'm correct, um, she's basically Joker's quote girlfriend until it's revealed that she isn't. Um, she plays a role there, really. When you're looking her through the film, you think, why is she there? Why is she? What's her purpose in this film? Other than maybe she's just a catalyst for the Joker. But in reality, she was just never there. That was the intention of the film. She was never supposed to be there. So I have to say, uh, Zazie Beetz um, didn't get to do as much as she wa I thought she would do. She's a great actress. She played Domino in Deadpool 2. And she's done some other great stuff. And I have to say, um, I would have liked to see more of her. But I can understand the purpose of her of her role. And I have to say, it really enforced Arthur's insanity in the movie. So I, I have to say, well done for Zazie Beetz. And finally, there's Randall, the co-worker. And I have to say, this is one of the most realistic co-worker takes I have, I've ever seen in a movie. In a comic book film, more, mostly. I, there's plenty of movies that are out there that are very realistic and they're very real and they have real issues. But a lot of comic book films tend to be in the fantasy, in, 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 in their own fantasy. And they, they, they pick characters that are so perfect and likable that there's never a gray area when it comes to black and whites. And this character, Randall, is someone who act very nice in front of Arthur, but in reality, behind his back, he was always talking mess about him. He was also finding ways to blame things on him. He was only looking out for himself. He didn't care about Arthur, and that's exactly how a coworker or any person that you would uh, that doesn't barely knows you would treat you. So I think that was a very realistic take as well. So I have to give props to the actor for that. Moving on to the story breakdown, I, have, I wanted to talk about Arthur struggling and how him not taking meds actually made him happier. It made him embrace his crazy side. Um, throughout the film, Arthur uh, attends um, a st his counselor. He has these counsel meetings with a psychologist, with a therapist, about because he has um, a mental illness. He has some issues, and he goes to these meetings, and they're not helping. The therapist isn't listening to him. It's she's ignoring his his thoughts and his his comments on life. He says, "I just told you you I never I never thought I existed, and you just ignore what I just said. You ask the questions you ask the same questions every week, and he's struggling, and he's not get, he's, he's struggling at work. You know, he gets fired for something that he 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 had no fault in. He got beat up by a bunch of kids, and the and the, and the sign got broken, but the boss didn't want to believe him. And that's the thing. Arthur has his his victim mentality where he doesn't." He knows he's broken, and that's why he's not stepping in to, to correct people because he thinks you should be the one realizing my situation. Why aren't you defending me instead of attacking me? And that's why he's putting these situations. Um, but you realize throughout the film when he doesn't have access to his medical to his medicine anymore, to his meds, because the, the funding for, for the program that he's in has run out of funds, um, he has to try to get, he can't get any more meds, so he stops taking them. And that's when he starts embracing and becomes more confident, more happier. He starts realizing that this is crazy side is actually the real him. So that's why he starts embracing it. And that's something I can really appreciate about the movie. Um, also, there's a scene I want to talk about, which is the coworker giving him a gun. And how people don't know that their actions have consequences. And how the, the guy was just trying to rip Arthur off because he knew that he was a creep. He knew that he had some mental illnesses. He knew he was wrong in the head. And he was trying to take advantage of Arthur's, uh, you could say mild mild nature really and take advantage of the fact that arthur would never fight back in a situation so he gave him a gun and, and told him to he would pay him later he in this this kind of incited the, the kind of incited and started the whole thing when he uh, with arthur transforming into the joker and you see that at the very beginning and it's crazy um moving on thomas wayne talking down in the poor i mentioned it before calling them clowns and kind of incited this movement um when you know arthur throughout the film he meets he gets into a metro into a subway station and he kills three wall street guys on self-defense really it's kind of shocking when that happens and it's crazy how the, the reason why it happens which i'll talk about more later um and how thomas wayne defends these wall street guys because actually in the, in the movie these uh wall street guys are actually very uh, they they try they hit on a woman and they don't leave her alone. They're they're they're, they're essentially scumbags in the movie. And Thomas Wayne defends them and calls them uh, like well well done men men well behaved men, uh, men of society, good men. And in reality, he didn't know them at all. And he's just saying that because they were his employees. And it's crazy. And then he calls poor people pl clowns, but yet he doesn't know poor people. He doesn't know poverty. He doesn't know what they're going through. And that's something I really like about the film as well. Oh, uh, this is what I wanted to talk about when in, when I meant that this is what incited the Wall Street guys to start abusing Arthur, and it was um, the laughter condition that Arthur has, which 
is a real condition where Arthur is laughing you know, uncontrollably. He has no control over this. And it, it doesn't really reflect what he's feeling. And it's a real condition. So he's kind of forced to laugh. And it feels so real when he's actually laughing. Because there's a moment when he goes up on stage in the Congo Bongo uh, comedy club. And he's like kind of like burping and like kind of trying to swallow in that laugh when he's so nervous. It's the most cringiest scene in the whole movie. But it's so real. And I feel so bad for him. And I'll talk about more why we can sympathize with Arthur. But not really empathize with him. Um, you know, he, and then there's a whole scene where uh, this, this is where you get to the point And another scene I want to talk about was him imagining his girlfriend. You know, this is all spoiler territory, guys. I'm talking spoilers all throughout the whole thing. This is a Joker review, uh, spoilers. And so what happens in the movie, he, he, he for some reason, he falls in love with this girl, the Zazie Beats character, and she, she embraces Joker. She likes him. She likes Arthur, even though he's kind of crazy. He, he, he there's, these, there's these questionable scenes where I'm like, really? You're really going to like you let him do that? And, and it turns out that she didn't. This was all in Arthur's head to cope with depression. She was really never there. And for people who have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. And you know how chilling the scene was when you find out that this was all in his head and how terrifying that was. Um... And you, you, you don't know what could have happened. You know, that, that, that there's this, this scene actually um, after he leaves the apartment. Many people are debated. Did he kill her? There's actually hints out there because I actually watched the movie twice. And you see the hints in the background. After Arthur leaves his apartment and goes back to his, there's actually sirens. And, and you see colored cop sirens in the background behind Arthur in the window. And you realize those are cops out here because they probably heard some shooting. And they probably went to her apartment because he killed her. It's most likely that he killed her and he killed the, 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 his her daughter. And because Arthur, the thing is you notice throughout the film is when things don't go his way, when people don't appreciate him, when they don't, they don't try to understand him, he goes mad and he shoots them. And that's something that's it's an obvious evidence that's been pointed out throughout the film. So I'm sure that he killed her in this movie. And people are debating. This is something that was already hinted in the movie. You just have to look at it really closely. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about was how the movie's making you doubt Arthur's telling the story the telling of the story because he though throughout the whole movie he's trying to he's telling you these scenes and how they are he has this imp interpretation of where murray calls him his son and then he has a, the congo bongo where he thinks he got a good performance done but in reality when you go and later on and murray is replaying the video he actually went nobody laughed and then there's the girlfriend scene where he supposedly had a girlfriend of the zazie beats character and in reality he didn't and then there was, you know, all these scenes that were inconsistent. So you can't really trust uh, Arthur's narration, narration of the story. And that's something that's unsettling because it, it, that's that's what I love about the movie is that it's such a great character piece. But at the same time, you don't know if this is true or not. People had an issue about the fact that this was an origin story. But at the same time, something that's so great about the Joker is how his background is a mystery. He always misdirects and tells these false stories. What if this was a false story? You never know. It was a great told story, but what if this was false? And that's something I can really appreciate about the film as well. Um, there was this whole storyline in the movie about Arthur and Bruce Wayne being siblings in the story, kind of like half brothers, because uh, Arthur was said to be Penny Flagg, his mother's, and Thomas Wayne's bastard son. And it was it was apparently a cover up, and and you know that that's what Penny told him told him that they were they actually had an affair. But then when in, Arthur goes and confronts him, there's this whole scene where he sneaks into the uh, rich theater and he enters the world of the rich. He's mesmerized by it. They're they're watching in the theater. Everyone's in their tuxedos and they're watching Charlie Chaplin, and it's great. And Joker's just like there in the middle, absorbing the comedy. He loves it. But this is a whole entire world for him. And then when he confronts Thomas Wayne, Thomas Wayne's like, no, this is all false. I, I never loved your mother. I never knew. She was crazy. She went to an asylum. She, you know, you were adopted. And this this rate, this kind of triggers Joker and, and, and Arthur. And then it causes him to get more upset and angry. And then this causes Thomas Wayne to retaliate violently. He's the one who strikes first, actually. And it causes a whole incident. And, and then this is when, you know, Arthur goes to Arkham State Hospital and he goes to check the records. He, he you know, he takes the, the records away from the employee who works there violently. And he realizes that he's been adopted. And then his, his mother, Pelini Fleck, was he was not even his mother. He was adopted. And she actually let her boyfriend abuse him when he was a child. And apparently there was a whole story that he was tied to a radiator, which is something that happens really frequently. 
which is also very terrifying. And the fact that you realize that this whole twist came out where his mother was the cause of his mental illness, the fact that he got a serious blow to the head because of the boyfriend abusing him. And now this causes Joker to retaliate. He loses, he and he cuts ties with his mother in a pretty in a pretty shocking scene while she's in the hospital. He actually kills her. He puts a pillow over her head and he suffocates her. And it's insane how happy he feels after that. Um, he even says when the coworkers go visit him after they hear about this incident and how she died, he's like, "Oh, I'm just celebrating because he's so happy about that. He he's done." And actually, when he's prepping for the Joker um, with Murray, because he's invited to the show with Murray, that's some, that's what I'm telling you. Murray, someone who tries to make fun of these people and tries to make fun of Arthur Fleck, and he see he, he sees a picture of Penny in the background and says. Um, T.W. Thomas Wayne with love and it's kind of like Brendan we don't know if Penny was the one that wrote that but it's a possibility that maybe Thomas Wayne actually had an affair and he has some money and the resources to cover everything up it's a possibility we never know and and that's the thing we can't trust Arthur's judgment on this it could be a total possibility and you never know the story the movie leaves it up for interpretation for you to think what you think and that's something I really appreciate about the film as well there's also plenty of crazy scenes where Arthur contemplates suicide. There's one where he actually walks into a fridge and then we, we think he dies. We don't know what happens, but it just cuts to the next day. And it's crazy because he tried to commit suicide right there. And then the whole movie, he's re once he finds out that he's going to be on The Murray Show, he's rehearsing his suicide on The Murray Show because he wants to kill himself because he realizes he made a punchline saying, I hope my, my death has more meaning than my life. He says he has this great line. And, and to, towards the end of the film, he realizes that's not what it is. I think he think he now knows that his life has more meaning than his death. And that's why he changes his mind during, when he's on the Murray show. And that's something great to, to, to dissect into that. Um, there's a lot of unselling moment when he kills. They're kind of like sh frequent and fast and you never see him coming. The only time you see a, someone, him killing somebody is when he kills his co-worker, when he has the, the little scissors. And that's the reason why you see that. But, you know, it's it's crazy. And there's also a, a kind of this um, this thing he does every time he tries to ease pain, depression, he dances. And there, it's, it's, it has the, the you know, the, the music by Hildor Guantori, um, the, the guy who made the, the back, you know, the, the, the orchestrated version, the OST of the, the Joker. And that playing in the background and him dancing in the bathroom scene is just terrifying and horrifying and and it's just such a great scene. I can see why they made the posters behind this, that's, that specific scene. Um, there's a lot of commentary on society, as I mentioned before, with Wall Street with the Wall Street guys who work for Wayne. And how Joker, towards the end, when he's on the Murray show, he says that if those Wall Street, when those Wall Street guys get killed, everyone cares. But what if I get killed? Everyone would just step over me. And it's such a true thing. People worry more about people who are famous, people who are big, um, influential people in the world, rich people, high class people. And they, they are more impacted by people who die there rather than people who live in poverty because they don't care who these people are. And that's such a true thing that Arthur re realized in his life. And that's something he wanted to change. He wanted to break the system. He wanted, and even though he said he wasn't political in the show, he really wanted to destroy that system. So that was another cool element that was in the film as well. Um in you know there was a lot of chilling moments especially the final scenes the the last third of the movie the third act of the movie was incredible horrifying amazing there was there was such you know it was it was it was amazing all the music that was in the background the joker and in the police car um the, the chaos around him and laughing at it and there's just so much great scenes when it comes to that uh you know arthur and and you know i've, I've just i think i've discussed everything there is really um, there, there's a lot of great scenes in, in the movie and there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's a lot of focus on depression and mental illness. Um, and that's something great. I really love about this movie and the fact, the fact that a comic book movie is really addressing this issue. And that's something that a lot, not a lot of comic book movies would do. And I think this is the first comic book movie that does something like this. And I can't wait to see that other movies, comic book movies do this as well with their character pieces, because there's a lot of characters in the comic book characters. That's what they do. They, they, they send issues through 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 comic book characters, through idealistic people like Batman. He has some issues. Superman, he has some issues. Everyone has some issues. And they don't make them the center of the tension when it comes to these movies. They focus on the action. They focus on the comic book aspect. And they don't focus on the message. And this is something the movie really did. So I can really appreciate when it comes to that. Um, and that, that really does it for the, the story breakdown. You know, the, the, there was a lot of aspects that went into it. But um, something I really wanted to go over 
was the music i thought the music was amazing i have a whole spotify playlist of the joker soundtrack and i just love um all these great songs that come in you know smile by jimmy durante i love send in the clowns by frank sinatra you know sunshine of your love by cream yeah there's you know there's that's life by frank sinatra also there's some great music you know the bathroom scene by hildor you know that, that that was a haunting i listened to that the most probably defeated clown by hildor as well and th th there's so many there's so much great music in this movie and that's something that can really and that, i love how it fits with the the feel of the movie where it's set it's set in the like the late 70s early 80s um it has that feel to it even the logos at the beginning of the movie when it starts the warner brothers is like has the 70s version logo and everything is so old even the the end sign at the end i was discussing this with a, on another show on on radio with a co-host of mine how it has that classic look to it and that's something that's really appreciated of me i think it's something that we can really appreciate is the details that go into this movie and how you see everything and, and honestly it's a timeless film but it's something you i love the the feel of it it's like an, it's like late 70s and early 80s and that's something you can really love about it also the cinematography in the film there's a reason why this movie was done in imax i didn't get the chance to see it in imax but there were so many amazing shots in this movie. There was that scene uh, where he's in the middle of a theater and he's kind of encapsulated by the entire the the, the scene in the theater and the Joker's in the middle. There's a scene where like they has he's behind the, the Murray shell in the background of the colors. The curtains are like blue, oranges and reds and he's smoking in the background. And he's just hearing Murray make fun of him in the background. And that's some, that's a great sh shot, too. There's just so many great shots in the movie. The elevator scene, that's another great shot. There's so many scenes in the movie that are just so perfectly done. I have to say the artistic look of the movie is brilliant. I think this movie will be a timeless film. Uh, you know, they, like I said, it's, a, it's kind of like a nod to Taxi Driver and King of Comedy. Yeah, but it's actually its own original thing. I really that's something I can really appreciate the film. He didn't, you know, there was a lot of buzz that Martin it took kind of took inspiration from Martin Scorsese's style. But in reality, Todd Phillips had his own kind of style and uniqueness to the movie, and that's something I can really appreciate when it comes to that movie. Um, it was really original, and I think it won't necessarily change the comic book genre. But I hope that knowing that the success of the Joker and the the awards that they won. For example, it won the Golden Lion Award at the Venice Film Festival. It premiered at the Toronto Film Festival. There's Oscar buzz about the movie. And I didn't get the best critically uh, reviews that they thought because there's just a lot of bias between Marvel and, and DC critics. And that's the reason why it has a 69% uh, Rotten Tomatoes critic score. But Rotten Tomatoes has come, become really irrelevant during these days, to be quite honest. I think it has an IMD score of 8.8, .8, which is in the top 10 highest, highest scored movies of IMDb of all time, which is absolutely amazing. Now, now DC knows that they can make movies like this with, with these issues and realistic takes and at the same time earn money because it did get the seventh highest, gro highest grossing R-rated film of all time and it got the biggest opening of October of all time. It, it, ha it makes money and it, and, and it also can be a serious take. So now the comic book genre knows they can make movies like this and earn money. So this is something I, I'm really looking forward to and this movie really is a game changer. Um, I have to give you know a little prep time, a little time for for Joaquin Phoenix and the prep that he did for this movie and how much weight he lost. Apparently, he only lost fifteen pounds, but it really looks like he lost like forty pounds because the man was skinny as hell. You could see his rib cages when he's opening up just a, a shoe, and he looks so like he's about a tw he's a twig. He's gonna break in half. And I have to give props to Joaquin Phoenix for going that extreme, being you know. Uh, method actor i think i have to uh, he that gives him even more reason to just have at least an oscar nomination for best actor uh, it was a film that really revolutionized the comic book genre i think um I, uh, people are asking if we're going to see a sequel um i'd rather not i hope i don't want to see a sequel i think a film on its own can stand on on itself it's already original um uh, something i also want to address is the fact that you can't really compare this joker to the heath ledger joker to any of the other jokers because it's so different it's so different in terms of the take it has and the message it has for the Joker. And I have to say that the Heath Ledger Joker focused more on the Joker side. This Joaquin Phoenix take focused more on the Arthur Fleck transformation of the Joker. And I have to say they're so different that they can't be compared. But they're up there with the best Joker iterations of all time with Mark Hamill. Um, there was, you know, when I watched the film, there was a lot of anxiety with this film because of the controversy with behind the film, the film and the shootings and the warnings that there were. There was a lot of cops in our theaters and it was a really scary thing. But when I watched it twice, um, my experience overall was well, other than the fact that I had anxiety the first showing. But it was just media throwing things over the top. 
Um, I recommend you guys to see it if you haven't seen it already. Although you shouldn't even be listening to this if you haven't seen it because this is a spoiler review on the Joker. Um, but do not praise the Joker, guys. You know, we can sympathize without empathizing. We can see the, the good, you know, the perspective of the Joker, but at the same time, we can't just agree with him and we can't uh, make him a role model or somebody to look up to because he is a horrible, evil man. And we have to remember that. But at the same time, it's not wrong to sympathize with him because of the things he's gone through. It's, some, it's a very realistic take. There's no black and whites in the world. There's gray areas all the time. Um, another thing I wanted to address um, for the last topic was the, the dark humor the movie had and the nature that made us laugh at Joker type jokes that shouldn't be funny, yet it was making us laugh. And there was the there was a scene where he kills uh, Randall in his apartment and then his other co-worker, he can't reach the lock. And then it's a really messed up joke, but we're laughing at it. And we realize this is a Joker type joke, yet we're laughing at it. So that's something I really had to address at the end of, of this review. Um, the, the movie really had these dark jokes that we were laughing at throughout the film. And we realize we're actually laughing at Joker jokes. So it's kind of funny to think about that. Um, but yes, to finish, to kind of finish this review, and I'll give you my overall score of the film, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, an objective take on the film after watching it twice, after, you know, reviewing it, after seeing other perspectives on the film, I have to give the film a 9 out of 10. It was a superb film, probably should be recommended for one of the best films of the year. There's so many more films to come out throughout the year. Don't, you know, don't expect the, the year to be over. There's so many great films coming out soon. I'll be actually reviewing those other films. There's Doctor Sleep, there's The Lighthouse, there's Parasite, there's Knives Out. There's Star Wars. There's so many great films that are coming out for the rest of the year, so stay tuned for those reviews as well. But thank you so much for listening to the Cinema Wire podcast and the Film Enthusiast Show. This has been your host, Juan, giving you my first movie review and episode on the Joker film directed by Todd Phillips. Go follow me on Instagram at Cinema Wire Podcast and on Twitter at Cinema Wire Pod to get updates on the next week's episode. If you're listening on YouTube, comment down below and give your thoughts on the film. Also, like this video and subscribe to my channel. This podcast will be available on SoundCloud and possibly available on Apple Podcasts. I have to make sure and see if that works. Again, thank you so much for listening, and this is Juan Barrera signing off. See you guys next time.